Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Corey, Education Specialist for WorldLink Medical, and I will be moderating today's event. I would like to mention a few quick items before we begin. First of all, please make note of the features available to you within your GoToWebinar internet browser. In the lower right hand corner of your screen, you should see the chat box where you can enter your questions to Dr. Petersburg. They will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. This web conference is brought to you by WorldLink Medical. We provide evidence-based CME accredited education in wellness medicine. We have a business of creating health course. Our business course is to help transfer your medical practice is quickly approaching. Dr. Greg Petersburg will be discussing how to develop a mission vision statement and effectively communicating your market message. In October, we are going to be having a new course, Beyond Hormones course. I hope you can join us for the Beyond Hormones course at the Lead Lodge Resort in Nebraska. Dr. Neil Rosier will be discussing how to dissect a research article. And Dr. Jerry Mullen will be instructing on GI and inflammatory issues. Don't miss this opportunity to learn about current preventive medicine issues and enjoy this beautiful resort that is affiliated with the Arbor Day Foundation. Today's event is sponsored by an educational grant from MedQuest Pharmacy. We are grateful for the continued support in recognizing the importance of patient and prescriber education in the field of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. They are true leaders in the business and we are proud to be supported by them. Today's speaker, Dr. Gregory Petersburg, is a popular international speaker, educator and consultant for physicians, medical professionals, and the public on lifestyle, proactive aging medicine, the art of medicine, and providing unique patient experiences. He has appeared on radio, television, and in print publications. His Art of Medicine workshops retrain physicians in the core competencies of medicine. He has 37 years of clinical experience that includes lifestyle, proactive aging, family medicine, and emergency medicine. Please welcome Dr. Petersburg. Thank you, Mary. And welcome, everyone. Let's begin with a story. I'd like to tell you a story. This story begins one cold December morning in a dreary little hospital in a cloudy city in 1950 in the Midwest. So, have I got your attention yet? You see, we're hardwired to hear stories. It's part of our genetic makeup. It's how we learn. It's how we teach our children. It's the, in all of human history, storytelling is the most tried and true method for passing along knowledge and understanding. It's also for those of us in a very technical world, it's also a way that we can share and communicate very complex ideas. And likewise, our patients can share with us very complex emotions and experiences that relate to their life and ultimately their health and the behaviors that connect them. You might not be familiar with um, Dr. Herrick, but he lived and practiced in a city not too far from the one I started to describe as my life story. Dr. Herrick was most known for the man who described sickle cell disease, and he first described the symptoms of myocardial infarction. But for our purposes today, he passed on some wisdom um, that relates to our topic. And that's that we might be able to learn more about this illness 
from the way that the patient has described their story than from the facts themselves, which is what we tend to focus on. A more modern contemporary of ours, a pediatric surgeon turned best-selling author, Bernie Siegel, who's written many books about the human side of medicine, the patient-provider relationship, and it's, it's dynamic as it relates to healing. And I think he's identified one of the issues that we face today as a professional. And that's that we're not trained in ways to make use of stories in our work, our clinical practice day to day. I think he said it very, very well. There's only one thing truer than the truth and that's a story. And that's what changes us. And in fact, we all have a story. That's what we're about to look at in terms of the patient. So that's the essence of, of our topic today, is really learning how to listen to your patients and hear their stories. Because it's the story behind the story that you and I are used to getting that oftentimes is the most important piece when it comes to outcomes. And that's where we're headed shortly. But I'd like you to kind of think back briefly so the last time that you felt like you were truly listened to, someone had their ears totally bent towards you. They were leaning in and they were listening to everything you had to say. You see, we all have a human need. This is a fundamental need and that's to be heard at times. And if it's one of our most fundamental needs, just imagine what it's like in the your patient's time of illness when they've been injured traumatically, emotionally, physically. You see, we really don't rely on our patients to tell us stories, partly because I don't have the time, right? I've got only 10 minutes for this appointment and if I open the floodgates and ask the patient to just tell me anything on their mind, I'm afraid I'm going to be here for hours. Instead, we've learned how to direct our, our uh, encounters. In fact, we call them an interview. An interview, by definition, is a one-way a one street. We're asking the questions. We're controlling it. We're there to rule out the disease, the diagnosis, the ICD code. And then we turn to technology for more tests to shortcut getting at the essence of, of what we think is the important part of the story. It's kind of like this checklist, you know, that we go through. We're all taught, you know, the proper listening skills. You sit down, you look at the patient in the eye, you pause, you repeat back what they're saying. This isn't the kind of listening that I'm referring to. You need to do this, but there's a time and a place for it. What we're seeking behind this story here that the patient could be sharing with us is their framework their paradigm, their logic. Because how many times have you sat with a patient and felt frustrated that you've been through this story a hundred times with them, you have repeated things, you've told them things, and you just can't figure out why the heck they don't comply. They're a you know, non-adherent patient, they're frustrating. Well, narrative medicine attempts to grapple with that and gain an understanding by helping the patient, first of all, gain an awareness and understanding in words that we can have a conversation about. Unfortunately, oftentimes, you and I get too quick to close the door because we want to make our diagnosis and we don't feel that we have the time or that there's a relevance to the clinical biomedical portion uh, of the work that we're doing. And what I'd like to do is challenge that because the things that frustrate you and me in a practice with that patient that just, I can't figure out why, why they just don't make that change, this is where you're going to find out not only why, but how to change it. So what is it if it's not just simply asking the patient, when did the symptom start, what makes it better, what makes it worse, how long does it last, et cetera. 
we want to learn some really truly effective listing. So let's let's take a look at an example. My father died when I was nine. He was in the army. He wasn't home very much. Two weeks before he died, he told me that in the Korean War, it felt like he lost his soul. All this time, I thought it was me. I have moved seven times in the last year. I've had several jobs. Nothing seemed to fit. I don't seem to fit. And when your father died, how did that make you feel? I don't know. I was nine. It was like there's this distinction suddenly between you and the rest of the world. I looked around me. Life went on just like it did before. But it wasn't like it was before. My uncle helped. He would visit. He at least listened. And I thought, if I could like my own thoughts, I could fly to the moon. Or at least Uranus. But if I couldn't do that, at least I could use my penis as a pogo stick. And that might be a way of getting around. Sir? Yes, that's good. Yes, well, I think you're making fine progress, Hunter. We'll talk later in group. Thank you. <sighs> well, I know that I know that none of you um, engage your patients that way, but I think it, it makes a point that um, you know this. If you're not familiar with this story, this is from the movie Patch Adams, and Patch um, had voluntarily committed himself to a mental hospital at one point in his life before he found purpose, and um, he found purpose by realizing that no one was listening, and it became his passion and his mission uh, to change that. So if you haven't uh, read the story or listened to Patch Adams live or seen the film, I would encourage it. So <clears throat> if you have a patient that you've ever somehow labeled as non-compliant, if they are just stubborn, resistant, a challenging person, um, the rest of this talk, I think, will be of some help to you. Not only to help the patient, but also to help yourself and how, you know, to change how you feel about the relationship. So let's start with the basic premise here of what narrative medicine is about. It starts with the belief that a lot of the ways in which we perceive our illness, ourselves, um, are constructed. They're things that um, we have learned to believe either culturally, socially, or in some way experientially in our past. So it affects every aspect of, of our self-image, including our health. And then we tend to ingrain those beliefs by repeating our stories. It's always been this way. I've never been able to lose the weight. I've tried quitting smoking a million times, but I couldn't do it. We condition ourselves to believe these things, and, and we don't even um, we don't even think about it, uh, other than that this is the reality that we have. And in fact, oftentimes it's a fabrication. It's one of three things: either we generalize about the world, it's always been this way, we distort things, you know, twisting the truth, or somehow we conveniently leave out things so that they fit this reality that we've constructed for ourselves. This framework here sits behind the problem that you and I think is the problem, and yet this perception of reality is really the problem that you and I have to spend most of our time on. Why? Because 85% of every problem that a patient comes to see a practitioner for today in the United States is a result of something that never had to happen. 
consequently, our job is to get much better at understanding why they happen in the first place. Now, you might think this is going to be too time consuming, but I guarantee you, if you're seeing that same patient over and over, year after year, and nothing's happening, then um, I think you'll find that this is not um, all that wishy-washy. It's not that time consuming. In fact, what we're really dealing with here is self-care. That's the bottom line today. Most problems are behavioral in their origin. The patients come to us when things aren't fitting into their narrative, into their, their paradigm, when it's not working. That's why they come to us. Okay. In the remainder of our session, I'm going to go over some um, techniques, if you will, for having a dialogue, a conversation, no longer interviewing the patient in the traditional directive format, but engaging in a conversation. And I'll go through each one of these and we'll, we'll give you some practical uh, examples along the way. And I'd like to do it sort of a, as a using a, a patient to give you some examples. So we're going to deal with a patient that um, I think is probably fairly common to most of your experiences. This is an adult a diabetic who um, has not been following through with any recommendations uh, made for a healthy lifestyle. So this is a, our patient, Mr. A, is a 51-year-old Caucasian male. He has type 2 diabetes that's uh, been progressing. And um, Dr. B, his uh, physician, has tried the typical traditional approaches of encouraging this patient to be regularly tracking his blood sugar and to be exercising. She's referred him to a nutritionist for uh, an ADA diet. He's on um, glucophage uh, for his blood sugar control, but every time he comes back, his blood sugar is still high. It's as though he hasn't followed through with anything. And Dr. B is beginning to see him as a very frustrating patient you know, non-compliant, and she's really getting sick and tired of it. You know, it's like we go through the same thing over and over and over. Maybe you've been there before yourselves. But fortunately, Dr. B um, learned a new way of, of having a conversation with um, her patient, a narrative approach, to get behind the scenes. And really it boils down to something quite simple, and it's just changing the nature of the type of questions that you and I pose to our patients. Okay. This, is the, this is the heart, but it's just a redirection. See, we're focusing typically on the chief complaint, which is ironic in that we decide that we have a chief complaint to begin with when statistically most of your patients have at least two to three issues on their mind when they see you. Nevertheless, we focus just on the symptoms and you know, all the details of it so that we can formulate our, our diagnosis and our ICD code for billing purposes. But the nature of these questions are really to sort of empower us with being able to come to that conclusion. And the nature of these questions are not particularly enlightening or illuminating for the patient themselves. And that's what's going to be different about um, the narrative approach here. Okay, so what we want to do is is um, add to our regimen of typical questions um, things that will generate and draw out from the patient their own life experiences, so that they can begin having some insight into why they've, in this case with Mr. A, become a non-compliant patient. Okay. We're going to just simply be facilitating the patient um, achieving some understanding, not us. Okay? We're going to try to draw out from the patient the, the types of um, links that they're experiencing with the outside world. What are the things around me, socially, culturally, etc., that are giving me a reason to be non-compliant? We also will be introducing, through some examples I'll give you here, types of questions that will allow the patient to begin to see another, another type of outcome 
in their own context and in their own words. So this slide here has, um, it's kind of a busy slide, but this really summarizes and provides um, a, a broad example of the types of questions that we can be um, posing to question, uh, posing to our patients here. For example, at the beginning here, the deconstructive type is really to begin to help the patient realize why and where they have come up with a reason to not engage in some dietary change or exercise. Um, you know, in, in the case of our, our 51 year old male, you know, wh why is it that somebody told you that real men you know, don't uh, pay attention to your health. And I know when I was doing sick care medicine back uh, decades ago, it was mainly the, the female in the household who would, you know, bring in her husband um, because he, he was really, you know, not as, um, not as interested or focused on his health and it had to be someone to drag him in. What was it that caused, you know, that sort of a behavior in, in, in the male patient? Another way that we can um, pose um, questions to our patients for their enlightenment, not ours, is is this renaming issue. You know, I might call you a non-compliant patient, but what would you call it? Uh, not quite that blunt, but my point is, how would we have them put in their own words what's happening in their life? And by doing so, you'll find out what these sort of social and cultural issues are that are resulting in that behavior. Sometimes it helps also to to bring in some perspective of what others around that. You know, does everybody feel that um, you, you can't control your diabetes? Your friends, your family, other doctors, um, do they all feel the same way? Well, patient's probably going to say no. So we'd like them to understand that it really isn't a generalization universally among everybody else's opinion. Now, by the way, as I go through these examples here, and we'll pull those out as I go through these techniques, but I am just want to hit on this slide, but let's keep in mind that this isn't a, a list that you just ask the patient one question after another about this and that. These are things that happen over a period of time your, your interventions and they're to help draw from the patient an awareness, consciousness of the influences that led to whatever the behavior is that we want to address and most typically because we're dealing with usually um, you know, non-compliant issues, we're helping the patient to find out what that is on their own and it's not our job to tell them. You know, and what would be different in your life if for some reason you, you, you did follow all the things that, that we think would be good healthy lifestyle, what would be different about it in your life? See, you and I know, but we want the patient to articulate. The same thing we could ask is, you know, if it continues this way, what would be different in your life? We're used to telling the patients that. And we'll come to some examples here. So, the, um, you know, the, we want the patient to begin to tell us about times also when they've been able to overcome challenges and barriers and, and, and get past you know, some issue. How is it that they were able to do it in other situations? The cognitive behavioral therapist will tell you that the more your patient will talk about changes they've been able to make, the more they articulate it and the more frequently the more likely they are to be able to follow through with it again in the future. Another thing that's um, quite helpful is when we can help the patient to sort of separate or ex extricate themselves from the, the problem. And in this case, the problem isn't the diabetes, the problem is the noncompliance. And when the patient can begin to sort of think of that as something outside of himself, it takes away the risk of feeling guilty because when people feel guilty or um, failure, 
they're less likely to be able to um, make a change. And if we can help them to say, you know, this problem exists outside of me. It's related to the culture, the society, uh, family influences, and other things that are doing it. Then it's easier for you to partner with the patient against that problem itself. I'll come back to that um, in, a, in a minute. Over time, as you begin to hear what that true story is that the patient's telling you, their narrative, you'll be able to have your radar tuned in. So when you hear that patient falling back into, you know, an, an old story that we've, they've maybe started to change, we, we can kind of call it to their attention. And then finally, you know, the support level of who are, who in this audience in the patient's world is going to be the most helpful. And that's usually the ones who are the most optimistic about the person not the ones who are the biggest pessimists. Starting out, um, as I mentioned before, it's easy for us to get focused too much on the chief complaint. There's a time and a place for that. Our job though is to not just get a medical history, but to hear the, the real story. By the way, you'll notice here this bullet point about getting a medical history without asking a single question. This is a, an interesting exercise I would um, encourage you to try. The point of, of um, getting a medical history without asking a question is to change the way in which we're used to conducting ourselves with a patient because we typically interview asking questions. You know, have you done this? When did this happen, etc. They're all closed in. But if you were sitting down on the couch at home with a friend of yours, you don't grill them that way. In fact, we oftentimes don't ask questions even though we get information. We could have it, you know, tell me more about this. Or, I'm really interested in that. That must have been really, really difficult. We can phrase things in a way that sort of invite the other person to communicate with us. What you'll find is that when you have a conversation about the medical history, your patients will reveal not only the information that you would have asked in a closed-end question, but they'll reveal it in a different way, which is what that quote early on that we saw stated. It's the way the patient tells the story that may be more revealing than the story itself. And then to pretend that we don't know anything about what they're trying to describe um, is a big challenge also because we want so easily to put things you know into a slot we want to we want to pigeonhole something as quickly as we can diagnostically and the moment we can stop that the more likely we are to be able to hear what the patient had really going on so we all can become sort of entangled and saturated in our problems and those problems that we have immersed ourselves into can become disabling to the point that we, we really can't control our lives or we believe that anyway. That we've been told so many times or in some way experience things to say I'm a failure or I can't follow through, I can't comply with this, I can't change my diet, that we get into a form of gridlock. And helping the patient to get outside of that is part of what the narrative is about. So in the case of um, our, our diabetic patient, Mr. A, you know, one day he said, well, everybody knows you have to be very compulsive to control diabetes, like Mary Tyler Moore. And I'm not that kind of a person, so you know, I'm sunk. Well, he's telling us his story and he's giving us a clue. And part of it's our profession that's contributed to feeling like this, society has too, and it may not be really what the patient would like to be telling us, but it's the only story that they know. You know, I have to be compulsive. Another way we can think about this is to just rephrase it, rename that problem. See, in in our in our medical world, um, wearing our, our you know, diagnostic cap, 
you know, we, we want to get a diagnosis. And we do that through testing and so forth to confirm it. But the narrative here is really looking at, you know, the, the patient's characterization of what's happening in their life. And by this I mean the characterization of our patient, not his diabetes, he knows he has diabetes. It's the fact that he's not engaging in behaviors that are helping control that diet, exercise, checking his blood sugar, etc. Understanding his characterization of that is the, is the issue. That's the problem. So we want to encourage the patient to use their own words to describe, you know, th this this issue, this behavior, in in their own terms. Because the more they can put it in their words, the more easily they're going to be able to control it. So in our case here, our our diabetic patient, Mr. A, he decided that instead of you know being a non-compliant, he decided that it was of an attitude, and it was an attitude that I don't care. At least now he's got a, a name for it, and it's one that he can hang his hat on, and we can begin to explore. And one of the ways that we can begin helping him to explore that is to externalize it, just like this fellow did here. You know, he's he's not feeling guilty. He said, it wasn't me. My genome made me do it. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but so, in you know, narrative the narrative medical approach is to say that, you know, it's not this person. This is not a, a resistant. This is not a stubborn person. This is not a lazy person. That's not the problem. The problem is the problem, and we want to separate it from the individual, externalizing it, so they can see what's happening, this behavior, how it's related to the world around them and the influence that it's had on them. Okay? So this is where it can be um, hard for us as clinicians thinking this is going to be really, really um, difficult, taking that time. And there is a little bit of time involved in conversations like this. But they can move along fairly simply by in part challenging these notions that, you know, I have to be you know, this hyper-controlled um, person like, like a Mary Tyler Moore, where does that come from? Let the patient begin to articulate it. The more they put it in words, the more likely they are to be able to control it, partly because they're pushing it outside, and now you can make that patient as your ally against that non-compliance um, or attitude of non-caring, as, as um, patient Mr. A put it. So in describing, well, you know, where did you hear all this stuff? Dr. B learns that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ignoring things. I know in my own clinical practice back in the sick care days, ignoring it was a very common thing for a lot of uh, my male patients. Um, and their, their spouses having to bring them in. Okay. So by changing this, we can begin sort of a re-understanding of our patient um, as well. And our relationship will begin to change. Again, the point of externalizing um, issues is to um, make it easier for the patient to deal with it. It's easier when you're not feeling guilty about it to talk about it. And at some point, um, Mr. A was able to, you know, kind of reimagine this as, well, this not caring thing, he says, I can, I can lick that. I can take care of that. We have a tendency, um, let's, let's say with smoking here for uh, this example instead of, you know, diabetes. We have a tendency to want to tell the patient all the effects of the problem. You know, if you keep smoking, you're running the risk of, you know, COPD, cancer, you know, high blood pressure, the list goes on and on and on. However, the narrative approach would be to draw from the patient what are the things that are likely to, um, you know, be different in my life if I 
if I let things continue as they are. So when you see Mr. A answering that question, you know, how will your life be different uh, if you continue to follow this path? You'll notice that he's not saying, gosh, if I don't uh, control my diabetes, um, I'm at risk for high blood pressure, and oh gosh, I'm at greater risk for a heart attack, or a blindness, or kidney failure, or Alzheimer's disease. You don't hear him saying those things. He's talking about the more pragmatic things that he sees day to day that are going to change in his life. I just have to go to the doctor more often. I'm going to have more pain. I might end up in the hospital. These are things that you know you and I as clinicians wouldn't be as likely to throw out to the patient, but when he draws it out himself, it's more likely to have an impact because if he articulates it, it's going to carry a greater sense of meaning. So it can be helpful to ask that simple question. Okay. And sometimes the patient can even sort of um, you know, create a name for this whole story. And that's what Mr. A did. You know, if I don't start paying attention to this thing, my story is going to be called, How to Let Diabetes Kill You. Teaching our patients to think about um, even their life as a story is part of our job as a, as a clinician. Okay. Now, in addition to exploring, you know, well, what's this disease going to do to my life? We can also explore the effects that the patient has on the problem. What influence does he or she have in, in his or her words? You and I could very easily say, well, you have influence. You can change your diet. You can do this. We would like the patient to begin you know, articulating the things that they can do. That will identify you, for you, most likely where they are going to be willing to make a change first rather than us telling them. And then reflecting on times when, you know, they've been able to overcome similar or to non-compliant issues. Tell us about a time when you've been stronger than not curing, which, you know, maybe um, beyond following his diabetic, or maybe he did follow his diabetic diet, or he checked his blood sugar every day for a week. Tell us about that. Tell us about that particular time when you were able to do that. You're asking the patient to identify the things that he drew from his life experiences that were different than his typical story of generalizations. And along that line, then, we can look for other kinds of exceptions to the rule. Um, we tend, again, to generalize um, about things that are affecting us in, in life, and we can challenge those. So we want them, what we're looking for is really an editing, a rewriting, uh, a deconstructing and reconstructing of, of the person's um, story. And we can help by, you know, listening for uh, moments of, of hope, possibilities for the patient. Um, and in this case, um, you know, our, our patient um, gave some examples keeping a job, beating a cocaine problem, I'll be darned, or a hope of wanting to be able to see his, his young child grow up. And then explore those a little bit. And instead of, you know, just passing them off and say, well, yeah, that sounds great. Why not explore those a little bit? Say, oh, you have been thinking about this, you know. How is it that, you know, that, that you can see that happening in your life? Simple questions like that. And paying attention to and honoring what the patient's preferences are. We always need to keep in mind that while this whole session is about the patients sort of rewriting their, their story, their narrative, um, it's not our job to, to, you know, to force that to happen, to convince them that they have to do it. Our job is to be behind the patient drawing out from them their own understanding and encouragement from themselves uh, rather than us. Now, we're not, we're not here to um, 
you know, tell the patient how their how their belief uh, about the world is um, doesn't make any sense. The job is to help them find that out for themselves. And um, there's there's nothing wrong with um, praising behavior because there's a good old saying, you know, behavior that gets rewarded gets repeated, and that's true. But the narrative approach here um, takes it a little step further. So when this uh, patient, Mr. A, you know, has started to eat um, a better, healthier diet, and we're we're learning this from the, from them, we can certainly say this is fantastic. But the more important thing is to move beyond that and say, let's get into, you know, how was it that you were able to do that? Draw out from the patient the things that allowed him to make that choice. If he talks about that, rather than us just saying, fantastic, keep up the good work, we say, tell me about how that happened. Let's explore that for a few minutes. That's where it's going to pay off. Now, you don't have to be burning incense and so forth in your practice, but there is a role for ritual. In fact, we already have rituals in our practice in terms of the things that we do. Um, when patients come in and check in, there's a ritual of signing in and a ritual of you know, getting this take, taken and the nurse will be with you. Those are all, uh, in a sense, rituals. Here's one, though, that um, might be sort of new for you. And this is to encourage your patients to take their own notes. You're taking notes either before or, I mean, either during or after the session, but how about the patient doing that? What that does is it helps them to become a little bit more cognizant of, of what's going on, and it, and it adds a level of significance and importance to the, the conversation. It will oftentimes be reflected upon by the patient for future sessions. They will develop insight by making their own notes. And you know we can we can also ritualize um, and, and memorialize events, milestones, achievements uh, for certain things. Um, in my practice, I have uh, little things that will you know if a patient achieves a certain milestone with with their fitness, I may have a pedometer that I give to them as a symbol of a milestone. Um, in this case here with, with Mr. A, once his blood sugar started to actually <laughs> achieving something that he'd never had before, his, his doctor gave him this certificate of unbelievable progress. Hey, you know, a little goofy, but it, um, was, it was capturing and memorializing an event. And as silly as it might seem, um, Mr. A, you know, he thought it was kind of fun to show his son. By doing that, it elevates the relevance. It, it, it's, it's a form of, um, it's like memorabilia. It, and the more we can share that with others and socialize it, the more important it becomes in our own lives. Okay. And finally, support. We all need support. You're providing support as a coach, a guide, instructor, a mentor. We need social support. And there may be a role for a higher level of support in, in, in some folks' lives, spiritual nature, whatever you want to call it. It's like being witnesses. And when we have, um, it's like it's like if you're up on uh, you're on stage, and the more receptive your audience is for whatever you do in your performance, the more it reinforces it. And you're part of that audience, of course, with the patient, uh, but those who are in their life outside of the four walls of your facility, family, friends, co-workers, etc., who are supportive of that individual, it's helpful to make that, you know, make it clear of what's happening. So Mr. A chose his audience, his girlfriend, his mom, and, and it's okay to symbolically choose support as well. People who he, in this case, um, have some connection with uh, or felt very strongly about in their life. I want to do this for them. 
Interestingly enough, in um, this particular case here, Dr. B had um, a discovery that she came up with herself. Before I began working with Mr. A in a narrative way, I didn't like him. When we became a team against this not caring, or as she previously called it, uh, you know, non-compliant, I stopped disliking him and started to dislike his problem. In other words, she was able to then, along with Mr. A, externalize, externalize this issue of not caring or non-compliance. And he started to care more about himself, and she did too, caring about him. As a result, um, as you can see, he, he was able to realize some new options and possibilities for himself. But also, she created, the doctor had a new story about her patient and the meaning and significance of, of what was going on. In summary, um, it's important that we understand that the way in which our patients experience their illness, their health, their um, illness experience is different than the diagnosis. And this health experience is something that's constructed through our environment, our society, our culture, our religion, our past experiences. And that, um, you know, we begin to see that this is the way the world is for ourselves. And that the reason that the patient seeks you out is because in their illness experience, you know, it's they can no longer deal with it. It's outside there. There's this dilemma that they're having, kind of a paradigm problem. But the patients can rewrite their story. They can edit it, bringing it more in line probably with what is, is it the truth in the world. And you can do that by helping them to be aware of what those sort of societal and cultural influences have been on them helping them to realize times when they've been successful in other areas. And that our job isn't to push it. We don't tell. In fact, um, my belief is that 21st century medicine um, is no longer about telling patients what to do. That's the old world directive style. Narrative medicine is one example of a non-directive guided style of, of medicine where we're, we're assisting the patient to discover for themselves the issue and to discover the solutions. And we're just along, um, you know, helping to guide that and nothing more. But it's the patient who puts those pieces together, not us. And I will tell you that after um, years of switching over to a non-directive uh, guided style of medicine, it's the most um, freeing form of practice I've ever experienced. It takes a huge burden and a load of, and a sense of responsibility off and eliminates all the frustrations that we would otherwise have toward our patient in certain instances. So remember, nothing else, ask some open-ended questions, not just your closed-ended questions. Be open, be willing to listen without interruption. Give them at least a minute talking time. Most physicians um, interrupt their patient within the first 18 seconds. Okay, and we want to begin, you know, kind of wrapping our this, this patient's logic um, into what's happening before we get caught up in thinking like a doctor, you know, and making that diagnosis. We have to get behind that problem to, to the, the real problem that led to the problem, if you will and then learning to translate things. So, in essence, um, the, the art of storytelling in, in your medical practice will improve the way education occurs. Your patients learn better. They will have a more memorable, meaningful experience with you. They'll have better outcomes because the issues of compliance and adherence uh, can be reversed. Narrative medicine then is um, simply um, a way of, for us to rehumanize our practice. 
if you are interested in you know hands-on experience with um, with these and and other skills of uh, 21st century medicine um, I just wanted to um, invite you to um, check out the World Link Medical link um, for information about the New Art of Medicine workshop that's coming up in um, in August. So um, at this point, um, I have reached the end of um, what I have to say, and I'm open for questions unless Mary has something that she needs to add. Uh, thank you, Greg. I, I just want to say for those of you that have just joined us, please note in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a question and answer box where you can enter your questions to Dr. Petersburg. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Petersburg. Well, I will just patiently if, if, uh, wait to see if there are any questions. If none, I wish you well and namaste. Thank you, Dr. Petersburg. I hope our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Archive versions for all webinars can be found on the website under Resources and Webinar Library. There's always new information coming out. Think about attending a refresher training if you haven't been in a while. If you're newer to World Link Medical, we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you again, Dr. Petersburg, and everyone who joined us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.